Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Stella Ray Herself podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. New episodes every Thursday. Thank you so much to everyone who's been listening. If this is your first time listening, welcome. Don't forget, if you enjoyed the podcast, to leave a review on Apple Music, comment down below if you're watching on YouTube, and post on your story a screenshot or an aesthetic pic or boomerang of you listening. I love seeing who listens. Beverage check, y'all. Comment down below what your beverage is. I have a Dunkin' from two days ago that <laughs> I have kept in my fridge. It's a medium cold brew with two caramel swirls. It's kind of good though, it's kind of hitting. And then we have a peppermint tea, Obvi. I'm currently one week ahead of my podcast schedule, which I'm glad about, which on one hand I'm glad about because then there's less pressure. Like if, you know, I had some traveling and whatnot, so there is less pressure to like have to record on specific days, even though I still have been, so now I'm just like ahead. But at the same time, like the day this goes live, I'm back from my New York trip, if you guys have been keeping up. I have to wait till next week to tell you guys how it went, because as I'm recording this, I don't know how it went, knock on wood. Also, if you're watching the video, you notice that my background is a little different. Things are disappearing every week, and <laughs> there's just some major changes coming up, and I'm very excited. I feel like I just have a solid plan evil eye but yeah i just feel very excited about the future and as it gets closer i'm going to you know officially announce my life and my plan and stuff but yeah that's basically been my life recently is just planning for this new life change let me know what your temperature preference is for inside your home because for me like i don't need it super super cold i don't really like it super cold not that i never use my ac but when it's really hot out and I have to keep my AC on all day, every day. I really hate that. I hate the like fake cold air. I feel like it always makes my throat dry, makes my eyes dry, it makes me stuffed up after a while. So I really don't like to have it on. And also I just be getting cold. <laughs> so if it's not like so, so hot outside, what I like to do is just turn it on for a little bit and then just turn it off. Like I don't just have it on and wait for it to automatically get to the temperature and then like keep going up. Like I hate that. And I hate sleeping with the AC on unless of course it's like super hot out, but I would rather a fan all night because I just hate the like, at least my AC is so, I mean, it's not so loud, but I just hate how abruptly it will start. And I've literally been woken up out of my sleep by it starting. So I really try not to sleep with it on. Um, but I feel like my ideal temperature, it really depends. I feel like on what I'm, doing like if i'm just sitting down bitch i it can get up to like 77 and i'll feel fine but if i'm up like doing stuff doing chores or hustling about or again if it is super hot outside obvi or you know if i was just out doing errands and i come back i do like it to be cold like i do run hot um i'm not someone that's like cold all the time like i my hands have always been like very warm. Bitch, there's too much heat in this body. But yeah, I just don't like it to be super cold. Like I just like to be comfortable, you know? I really don't get when people like their houses to be like below 70 degrees. I don't get it. Like, yeah, if it's super hot out, I will, even that though, like I'll just let the cold air blow till it's like 72 and then it's fine. I, how do y'all do it? I don't get it. Like I love when it's winter and it's kind of cold out and I'm sleeping with a lot of blankets and I'm like cozy, you know, like I like that vibe or if I'm watching TV, like I do like to have a blanket on me. I think most of us relate to that. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to like just turn my AC on, AC on to 66 degrees and just leave it like that all day. Like what? When my dad was helping me move last year, he kept wanting to turn my AC on and just like let it be on. And I was like, bro, no, like that is so like that's money right there like i'm not just gonna leave it on you know like we'll turn it on for a bit and then like turn it off and he like kept tr trying to turn it down <laughs> and it's like okay like i'm not gonna let you know a guest in my home or like especially my dad you know suffer but it was like it was not that hot so it was so funny to have the roles reversed because we didn't grow up with ac most people in washington state don't have ac but you know with the heat and stuff like he would always be like oh like i mean he wasn't super oh about it but even stuff like like having the refrigerator open for too long like i specifically like i literally think about it every time i open my fridge i just remember this one time i was like that's like 10 cents every minute or every second you have that open it's like an extra 10 cents so then i got to be the dad and be like stop 
that's money <laughs> but even regardless of money it's just like i don't like having it on if i don't have to so much rather would have a window open you know like i just like the natural air but obviously if it's super hot out like i'm grateful for ac you know but like sometimes <laughs> bro climate change though like um and i know someone so many of us are like exhausted of the subject i think just because it's like what the fuck are we supposed to do you know but i just wanted to share this i just don't remember it being this hot out in october in general like here in la but then also back home and then it's funny because my snap mems from i think it was six years ago i was in paris and i just remember being so cold and if you guys watched my vlogs at that time especially the first few days that i was in that airbnb by myself before sonia got there the heater didn't work and i had to wear literally every jacket that i brought and sweater to sleep under the covers until the airbnb host brought like a space heater because it was so cold so i was like bro i don't like is it that cold now so i checked and it's literally the high is like a whole 10 degrees warmer of that week than it was in 2016 because i literally i looked up the 2016 weather of paris for that week to compare and it's just like so ew that's like literal global warming <laughs> Like, why is the high 70 degrees in October, mid-October, you know? So I've just been thinking about that recently. It's been, like, a fun reflection. But in better news, I really want to go back to Paris next year. Just, like, back to Europe in general. Just for the content. Just for the outfits, honestly. Like, I've really been building my fall wardrobe. And that's also why I'm so excited for this New York trip and just... You know, it's just like, I want fall. I'm sick of it being hot. It has been cooler here in the mornings, which is nice. I get a little bit of fall vibes um, and at night, but just during the day, it still will be like 85 degrees and it's just like, stop. It's not enjoyable. If you guys have been watching my IG stories, you know that I've been rewatching The Sopranos basically for the second time. I think I tried to restart it or I like started to restart it. Because I watched it for the f first time in full length last summer, like early last summer. Um, so this is my first time like fully watching it again, like committed to it. Like it's pretty much the only show that I watched that I'm watching. And it's just such a better experience because, and I'm sure most of us can relate, you know, the second or third time even that you watch a show, you just pick up on more stuff. And because you're not trying to learn the characters and learn just the structure of the show and the plot, like you can pay attention to other details. And something I found really interesting, and I wouldn't say this is really a spoiler, but I guess if you plan on watching it and you don't want to hear anything about it, maybe don't listen, but it's not like a spoiler. It's just like something that happens in the second season but basically there's an episode where all the guys go to or most of the guys go to italy and i just always remember it as the episode where like they go to italy just was able to pay attention so much more to what carmela soprano is going through at that time and it's so interesting because you know i've been reading these bell hooks books about feminism patriarchy how emotionally unsatisfied so many women are in heterosexual relationships. So I got a whole different perspective on this episode now because I was paying more attention and just aware more so of the fact of what was going on. So some of the mob wives are at lunch and one of their husbands was missing for a while. So that was kind of like a storyline, but he came back. So Carmela and the other wife are like, oh my God, you must be so happy that he's back. Like your husband's back. He's not like dead or missing. And she, at first she's like, yeah, like I, you know, thank God he's alive. But then she kind of breaks down at lunch and she's like, oh my God, no, he just never asked me about myself. Like when I heard him say, oh, I'm home, that one day that he came back, like I wanted to throw up, like I want a divorce from him. This lifestyle just isn't for me anymore. Like he doesn't care. Like I might have cancer. I'm waiting to get the results back and he just doesn't even acknowledge it or ask me about it or ask me how I'm feeling. And so they're like, oh my God. And Carmela especially is like, well, you don't want to do that. I don't know if she starts out saying, oh, well, like don't get divorced. But later in the episode, you kind of see her and the wife like hanging out and she's just like, I really need a divorce. And Carmela's like, no, divorce is a sin. Think of the kids. Like you don't wanna, you don't want your kids to think differently of you. Basically like trying to convince her friend not to get divorced from this, you know, mobster who's like not good to her. And you know, just in a relationship that she's unhappy in. And 
basically being emotionally abused in. And then later, Carmela's kind of talking to her sister-in-law about the situation with this other wife. Like, oh, she's thinking about getting divorced. Oh my God. And the sister-in-law is, especially at this time, just a little more free-spirited and kind of like a hippie, like low-key. And she's like, yeah, like, I don't know why any of you are with those men. You know, like, you're so smart. Like, why... Are you limiting yourself to this like small role as just like a wife and a mother? First, she's talking about the other wife, but then Carmela realizes she's talking about her. And so she's like, you're talking about me, aren't you? And she gets very defensive, like, oh, well, like, I'm not like that, blah, blah, blah. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. But you can see it's like she's getting defensive because she knows it's true. So then the episode ends, and I had no memory of this whatsoever. The episode ends with Tony coming home from Italy and he says, I'm home. And she's like in the bedroom and she just has this look on her face like she wants to throw up, you know, and that's how the episode ends. So it was just so interesting because I've been reading these books and it was just so in alignment with those books. It's such a significant episode in their relationship and i think this is why this show is just such a good show i think what's so powerful about this show is that it has so much depth and just shows how this kind of lifestyle affects people you know in all the various ways from the mobsters themselves to the wives to the children and just everyone around them and it's just so interesting especially to watch now that I've already seen it and can pay attention more to those things and like the little details and things I might have missed the first time. Around. So if you haven't watched it, I would definitely recommend you watch it. Yeah, I never watched any more of the Jeffrey Dahmer show. <laughs> I just wish it was like less horrifying, but I guess that's like the whole point. I did think, and I can't remember if I talked about it on here already, because it was like quite a few weeks ago that I watched the first episode and was like talking my IG story about it. Like, does it get worse? any like worse and like scarier and everyone was like yes it was just too much like i was getting scared i don't like being scared <laughs> like some people love scary movies i just don't like i just don't need that you know i have enough anxiety babe like i just don't need that like stress in my body i would much rather watch some mobsters like shooting each other even that episode of euphoria where rue is like stuck in that lady's house like, that was, like, a sliver of, like, what the first episode of the Jeffrey Dahmer show was. Because it's just like that. It's just so personal. Like, you can imagine yourself in that situation and just how terrifying it would be. And that's what makes it, like, so... You get this away from me. Like, it's... It was just... Oh, it was too much. If you... I don't get how people, like, binge watched it. I had a friend who, like, was like, yeah, I watched all of it in two days. How? Like, yeah, it was very well done, but, like, too well done, honestly. Like, I don't need it to be that well done. I don't need to know, like, and even just reading, I was, like, reading some stuff on Wikipedia about him just because I didn't really know that much. And I was, like, I'd rather just read this than the show. And even that, like, and especially after watching the first episode, it was just too much. Like, I started to feel gross just reading that. So that brings us to Loki, our question, one of our questions of the day. Do you think people are inherently good? Question mark. I posted this on my IG story a few weeks ago and I did a little poll. It was like, yes, no, and it's complicated. It's complicated one, as I kind of thought it would, but definitely more people said yes than no. So I looked up some articles about like, you know, I just wanted to know if there was any studies done behind this. This is an article from CNN titled breaking news alert people are inherently good and non-violent when we hear about bad things happening especially when lives of many are lost or damaged at the hands of a few we need to remind ourselves that people are generally good we are hardwired for goodness it's easier to recognize this fact when you think of children without mitigating factors their innate goodness would not erode with age but goodness is not the sole virtue of the young the vast majority of people when faced with simple clear ethical choices Choose good over bad and even good over neutral. Imagine a stranger's baby is about to fall off a chair next to you. You would try to catch it, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Intuition tells you that you can count on nearly everyone else to try to catch that baby too. Empathy is an evolutionary gift, an instinct that extends in concentric circles from the self to loved ones to communities 
to countries and for the enlightened all of humanity. We start from a place of moral purity, but under certain circumstances, we are all capable of doing things to others that are painful and vicious. Some of these acts go beyond our capacity to immediately understand them, and we might label evil what is really illness, fear, desperation, hate, or a combination. Hate and desperation in particular have seeds in abuse, hopelessness, isolation, poverty, and other injustices. Hate is also taught. But nonviolence and empathy can also be taught and put into action to eliminate these causes. Understanding our fundamental goodness and potential to change is not a mere philosophical exercise. Our conclusions directly affect how we see the world, and how we see the world affects whom we, as we elect as our leaders. Those leaders affect which laws we live under and how we combat violence and the causes of violence. Look for opportunities to break cycles of violence near and within you. And think about starting a discussion the next time someone calls another person or group of people evil. A discussion that does a better, more solution-oriented job of understanding the root causes of deplorable behavior. So it's like, I want to believe that people are essentially good, but <laughs> I just think because of our society, most people are living out of survival, you know, because, you know, most people are stressed about money. Most people do not have great mental health. You know, mental health is not really a priority in our society, even though, you know, it's getting to be less controversial and more talked about. That doesn't mean like, you know, hopefully we're headed in the right direction, question mark. But today is actually Indigenous People's Day that I'm recording this. That just reminds me of the book I read a couple years ago, but it's basically kind of the history about the United States and the real history, like not the, oh, grade school, like Columbus discovered America, but like the real shit, you know, the genocide, the violence, the foundation of the United States, it was built on those things, on violence, on control, on domination. And we can still see that today, you know? So it's not like we're living in a society that supports all people and you know has enough resources for people and the right resources for people so therefore if you're living under those conditions you know if you're oppressed you're gonna do what you have to do so it's like yeah you'd hope most people do have a moral compass and i would say most people do have empathy to some degree but i feel like for the most part i mean we can even just see this with the pandemic the amount of people that didn't want to wear masks that don't want to wear masks that don't want to get vaccinated the, the amount of people that you know were even in our peer groups or you know people our age people that would not stop going out partying you know in the lockdown days because they just were like i don't care I, i'm putting myself first you know and not in like a healthy setting boundaries way but like in a at the cost of others way um and i just remember personally like that was a time that i feel i started to realize a lot of things about different relationships like friendships and just like oh i thought we were on the same page but i guess not you know like i want to take this seriously i am taking this seriously i don't want to expose myself i don't want to put others at risk you know i don't mind wearing a mask bitch still to this day i wear a mask and people will ask me like why do you still wear a mask like, you don't have to wear one and it's like yeah i'm wearing it less than i did in the olden days but like bitch if i'm grocery shopping i'm putting a mask on but also like i've discussed it's just like i don't really like people looking at my face also so it's kind of like a chic accessory at this point so yeah i think that's like a big recent example of like you know i think just a lot of people have low-key a disconnect because our like a disconnect to, to others and like the feeling of collectivism and just you know what i do affects others i want to care about others even if it doesn't directly benefit me um, and I think because our society is so individualist, I remember reading something about how, you know, the nuclear family, once that idea was really introduced, it, that was kind of maybe the start of like this individualist culture because things were no longer about the community at large. It's like, I just want to do what I have to do for my wife and my two kids you know and fuck everybody else as long as we're good like that's it and it's like you do kind of have to live like that in our society and while that doesn't mean you know on the other hand things i talk about a lot you know 
That doesn't mean putting everybody else's needs before your own or never telling anybody no because it's like, oh, I feel for them. Like, I want to help them. But it's just that vibe of, like, doing the right thing. You know, if you find a wallet, are you going to try to locate the person whose it is? (laughs) Are you going to ask somebody if they're okay, you know? And it's like all of these things are connected. You know, when we start with ourselves and we're practicing kindness with ourselves then we can be kind to others. And it really does make such a difference. Like, and y'all know I've talked about, like not to literally talk about the same thing all the time, but it's just always so relevant. Y'all know I've talked about how even just small things like saying no, like if someone asks you, oh, do you want to do this this weekend? Just say no then and there, or, you know, however you want to phrase it, but just politely declining then and there instead of being like, oh yeah, like I want to be nice. I feel like I should say yes. So I'm just going to say yes and cancel later. It's like, that is kindness. You're like not wasting the other person's time by like therefore canceling later. Um, And then that person's going to have more trust in you. And I feel like that just builds, like, like that's just a small example of how we can like build trust and kindness in our world, you know? Like it really does start with ourselves. So bitch, all those like cheesy posters, you know, in like, our middle school classrooms of like, do the right thing, practice kindness. It's really true because even just, me and Sonia were actually talking about this recently, um, especially as an adult. I think we were talking about birthdays and how as you get older, it's not about, you know, gifts. It's not even necessarily about, I mean, for, for some of us, it's not even necessarily about what you do and having like, oh my God, the biggest birthday party ever and all that. It's just really about, you know, people showing up for you and the people that you care about being there for you and like just time in itself is like such a precious thing. (laughs) Um, So to have someone like go out of their way for you and I don't know, that that's just like so much more meaningful. So do what you say. I think we can cultivate, you know, again, more trust and kindness and just good feelings by doing what we say we're gonna do so that doesn't mean saying yes to everything but it's like if you say yes do it if you don't really know where you're not sure say i don't know i'm not sure or say no and doing the right thing and i think just really leading by example you know because again it's hard when we do live in a society that does not really that you know low-key like claims to 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 promote those things but then it's like okay well why isn't the government practicing kindness then (laughs) why isn't the government doing the right thing why is there still war crimes being committed but like low-key um yeah it's like hopefully just leading by example will do something better It's, it's like i just want to practice where i preach And I know the world I want to live in. I know in my interactions with people, I want people to be real with me. I want to be able to trust people. So that doesn't mean I'm going to go around trusting everybody. (laughs) Okay. But it means that I am going to be a trustworthy person, you know? So I don't know if any of this is like relevant to you, if you're feeling any of this, but let me know if you relate and just let me know what your thoughts are just on that question i know it's a very loaded question i feel like we could spend so long talking about it but do you think people are essentially good um and how what effect do you think society has on that you know the nature versus nurture thing i do think people are born good but i do think a lot of it is nurturing and the society that we grow up in read communion by bell hooks so the recent books i've been reading are well i've basically finished um the will to change by bell hooks which was about men masculinity and love i it was good but i do like communion better i feel like it was and i mean it makes sense it's just more relatable to me because communion was more of a book for women to read you know it was more validating about the female experience Ah, females and just especially reading these back to back a lot of the ideas were very redundant in this book but there were parts of it that were very good and it's like i wish every man would read this book something i was really thinking about while reading it especially the chapter on violence and again it's so funny to watch the sopranos while reading this book about you know men and masculinity and patriarchy (laughs) but just how 
just that idea, and I, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this before, but just how when you, yeah, because there was that podcast clip of like recognizing scams, when you can like learn about something like in this instance, learn about patriarchy and this societal role of masculinity and how masculin- masculinity is defined in this dominator culture, if more men were just aware of that, that it's like this like built system like thing And there's not like something wrong with them for like, oh, feeling something or like, oh, like, I don't want to be teased for being soft or like, what if people think I'm gay or like, you know, all these fears that men have and especially, you know, teenage boys, you know, that transition from childhood to adulthood, um, because that's when a lot of men are really forced to like shut down emotionally just because of society. Um, I think a lot of men would be able to fight back and like, because that's the thing, like, yeah, in this patriarchal culture, like, men are able to dominate women, and that feels good because that's, like, what they've been taught to do and, like, what their role is. So if they're doing that, it's like, yeah, this this feels good because I'm doing what I'm supposed to. <laughs> it's like, I can't imagine that you feel complete in yourself and, like, a whole person because you're still a human, and humans have emotions regardless of gender or whatever. So it's like you're just suppressing yours and... Like I've said, like, that's why those those posts go around, like, oh, like, we're just supposed to make money and shut up, like, nobody cares about us. And it's like, well, it's not that, like, women just don't care about you, period. It's like, that's just what society has taught everyone. And, like, there are a lot of women that perpetuate patriarchy and, you know, gender stereotypes. A lot of women claim that they want a man to emotionally open up to them and whatnot. But then, like, when you get that, it can be kind of questionable i think bell hooks actually had uh an experience like that i can't remember if it was in this book or communion but she talks about how she had this i don't know if it was like a boyfriend or like just a a sexual partner but she would tell her girlfriends like how this guy would was just so open to pleasing her i guess and just very communicative and like wanted to know what she liked and it was like so much so in a way that her friends were like are you sure he's not like gay like that's so weird because we're just so used to straight men you know just (laughs) sex is very like supposed to be a certain way you know um so yeah it's just so interesting to learn about and just reflect on your whole life and just realize like oh that's why that happened the way it did. That's why that person acted like that. Um, And again, the more you can be aware of it, the more you can like recognize it, not internalize it and like just see things for what they are instead of like, oh, like why, I don't know. Why am I so emotional and men are not? Or like as a man, why am I not allowed? Am I the only one that experiences like emotions? Like am I a little bitch? Like my teammates told me when I was eight I don't know (laughs) but you know so I would still recommend it but I think for the girlies you should definitely start with communion because that definitely just hit a lot more um because it was more like almost a personal validating experience whereas this book to me um was just more like learning vibes you know what I mean um but yeah especially if you're a man like you should read this book because I think it would be very validating for men you know and hopefully just inspire some kind of thought around that you know like oh it's not like me it's like yes i'm a part of this system and this culture i'm a a result of that but it's not like there's something innately wrong with me and it's just like again like i said before recognizing these scams learning about them is the only way to change knowledge is power read a book period um i'm also kind of reading dare to lead by Brene brown i'm not sure if i'm gonna fully finish it there are some really good ideas in it just some of her language is definitely like quirky and it's like (laughs) that's why i really like the bell hooks books because it's just straight to the point and like the facts and like low-key like that's what that's what i like (laughs) but in this chapter i read before something that really did stick out to me was just getting especially you know i think this book is more so about work vibes and like if you're a boss or like the leader of a team or whatever um just how to be a better leader in that way which i don't think i realized till i got the book but something she says on page 67 is leaders must either invest a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings or squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to trying to manage ineffective and unproductive behavior 
What this means is that we must find the courage to get curious and possibly surface emotions and emotional experiences that people can't articulate or that might be happening outside their awareness. If we find ourselves addressing the same wait. If we find ourselves addressing the same problem problematic behaviors over and over, we may need to dig deeper to the thinking and feeling driving those behaviors. And then there's a example of like the words lonely versus disconnected and how I think it was like in the military or something they were like, "Oh, like do you feel disconnected?" And then the whoever like leader was like, well, why don't you just say lonely? You know, like lonely is like a word that is a lot more powerful. It's more personal. It's less sterile. And it's actually going to hit people. Like people are going to be able to relate to that. And while it's scary to admit that like you're lonely, it's like when once you know what you need or once your boss knows, you know, what you need. I think they gave the example of like soldiers. Like if you're tired, yeah, I'm going to send you home. But if you're lonely, sending you home by yourself isn't going to make a difference. So it's just about having the courage to actually voice our needs. And then as a leader, like being able to like initiate those tough conversations. And I think that's so true in, you know, relationships as well, interpersonal relationships, friendships, whatever, just relationships of any kind. Not being afraid to ask, you know, if something is wrong or to initiate a tough conversation and that's where, I don't know, conflict resolution really comes from. Um, and I just think a lot of people like don't know how to do that. And I'm not saying that in like a, a condescending way or anything. It's like, bitch, I didn't know how to do that for a long time. And it's still something that is really hard and scary. Um, but especially in friendships, you know, like, I think that's just such a classic example. Like people will have a problem and instead they're like subtweeting each other or you know just doing all these like passive aggressive things when really it's like you're just scared for you know what feels like a confrontation or just the initiation of a conversation that is real and vulnerable and that could lead you to being closer so that's like the key you know and so many it's just like not taught to us so therefore a lot of people just don't really know how to go about that but it is a skill that you can learn um, and that doesn't mean like, oh my God, all your relationships will be so great after that. It's actually quite the opposite. I found like the more, well, I think it just depends. It's like people are either going to realize that you are making the effort to, you know, oh, like they actually want to know how I'm feeling and what my experience is. They want to actually communicate or, you know, they're not going to get it and you just have to move on. But either way, it's like you're going to get clarity on where the relationship, again, could be a friendship, all relationships, on how how deep it can go and in what direction it's heading. And then you can proceed there instead of just like, oh, I'm scared to like talk about anything. And like, I'm just going to like subtweet or like post quotes on my story and like maybe they'll see it and think something, you know, bro, I fucking hate that shit. Like the amount of grown adults, the amount of like grown celebrities doing that, it's just or like just grown adults period it's like bro like this is a skill you can learn but i think just i think people like don't get that and like it's not very supported you know people are always like oh you have to communicate in a relationship to make it work but a lot of people just don't really know how to communicate so that's like interesting for sure let me know if you've read either of those follow me on goodreads um and yeah so thank you guys so much for listening that's going to be the end of this podcast but i hope you guys enjoyed again don't forget to post on your story if you enjoyed tag me so i can repost check out my merch the new beverage tote bag linked down below and i will see you guys and talk to you guys next week love y'all